Why don't we start off, Ken, with uh, telling, just giving us a little about your background and who you are. Yeah, um, I'm Ken Bogner. I was born and raised in Southeast Montana, where I'm currently the state senator. Before I served in the state senate, I served four years in the Marine Corps. I did two tours to Iraq. I got really interested in, well, geopolitics, but politics in general. And so I used my GI Bill uh, to go to Columbia University. After I was there, I went and studied some more overseas uh, just to expand my international relations kind of bent. Uh, so I returned home and decided, I think I want to do some local politics instead. And worked a legislative session here in Montana as an aide. And I got asked to run myself for the state Senate. And I ran in 2018. Had a very tough race. Mary, but I won that. And I had run on rural economic development. And I started digging into that once, once I got elected. And I live in a very rural, I represent a very rural aging population. And at rural economic development to be a priority here and investing in our community. I started asking constituents, you know, what, what can we do? And the thing that came up over and over and over was healthcare costs are, you know, limiting me from doing anything that I want to do and investing. Uh, so this is where the expanded right to try came from. We can get into that, but uh, that was the previous session. And now I am running for U.S. Congress, at least to the federal level. And can you tell us sort of how you came to your, how you, tell us about your educational process about longevity and, and the issues around longevity? Well, it, you know, it goes back to me figuring out that it's not for rural economic development. It was more about lowering healthcare costs. And so I started out, I'm not a healthcare expert by any means. That wasn't, that's, you know, I'm a Marine, uh, more concerned about economic development and privacy rights. So I just started asking around people I knew and I had a mutual friend who said, hey, listen, you need to reach out to Dylan Livingston with A4LI. They're doing good stuff in the government space and might have some ideas. I got in touch with Dylan and we kind of brainstormed. We were running up on the legislative session and we, we had some ideas, but we didn't really know what was there. We had some grant ideas to help with research funding, but here in Montana, we have a pretty conservative, fiscally conservative legislature. So we decided against that and that our best option was to just expand on what was already there. And that was the medical right to try. And that is how right to try got actually implemented passed at the federal level. Uh, the, the initial one was all these, all these states went ahead and did it. And then the federal government adopted it. But we said, that needs to be expanded. Let's lead the way on other states, expanding it as well, so that the federal government takes notice and does the same. All right, so, so walk us then through uh, what Right to Try is and uh, your bill and, and, how, uh, and, and, and the process of getting it passed. So the Right to Try bill that's at the federal level and was in Montana is that individual can try a experimental drug uh, but it has to be past phase one of FDA approval and they have to be terminally ill and we said let's expand that so we said the easiest thing to do would just remove the terminal you know the terminal requirement that if anyone can try a phase one approved drug if they want you know, you should have the option as long as you know what the the risks are, you should be able to take it. So that was the first thing that the Montana bill does is allows you to take a phase one approved FDA drug, but you have to have exhausted uh, all other options. Oh, sorry, not exhausted, considered all other options. You have to have a provider uh, approval and you have to um, remove your uh, the liability to, to sue uh, if you take these 
you, know, you have to give consent that you will remove liability to enter into the expanded right to try. And so what you did there, it, it was further than what they, it, it basically goes further than the federal laws. Was there any repercussions on a federal level to your, your, your state passing that law? Uh, we haven't seen any yet. Uh, we were hoping that the federal government, you know, this is, you know, Montana is just a smaller state. They kind of uh, are paying attention, essentially, and want to see how things go before they before they have any pushback. Uh, that's what they did with the original right to try bills that were going through the states is they didn't push back very hard because they wanted to see if it was actually working. So we haven't had any pushback yet in Montana from the feds and hopefully they'll wait and see what the results, results are, are here before they maybe take any, take any action. And and just to, so I, I'm, I'm sure I understand it. What you're saying is that states did a, a, a right to try bill that were for terminally ill people that if it would pass phase one, they could try experimental, experimental medication that passed at a federal it. level. And then Montana, you tried to expand the definition. You took out um, the the, def the terminal part so that anybody can try a, uh, a f uh, something that's past phase one. Provided I understand there's other e efficacy requirements that you had, but but that that was essentially what you got, and it passed, right? It did. It's uh, exactly right. Uh, I think it was. I want to say early two thousands. You know, states had asked the feds to pass this. Congress didn't act. So they just said, all right, we'll do it ourselves. And so we took up that same model to remove the terminally ill requirement. And in Mon Montana, if you want to remove liability or something, you need two thirds votes in the legislature. It's just, it's in our constitution. So we had an uphill battle. We just didn't know where it would go. We didn't know who the opponents would be of this. We were concerned that you know, maybe the feds step in, maybe some, you know, big pharmaceutical companies come out against this bill. We just didn't know where we were at. So when we introduced the bill, we had a pretty good reception. I was surprised that uh, there was both Republicans and Democrats that thought this was a great idea. Uh, there was some on the extremes, both left and right, who were very worried about this bill. Uh, you know, the further right thought it would uh, open the you know, open the gates for, open the floodgates for, uh, you know, uh, recreational mushrooms or psychedelics. And then the far left thought it was kind of a rebuttal to some of the uh, drugs that were were taken during the pandemic. So, so the extremes the, were really weary about it, but we had enough of the middle, middle both Republicans and Democrats, Democrats to get two thirds votes. We got it passed and then we got the governor's signature and it went into effect October 1st of last year. Very good. And uh, have you spoken to any of your constituents who've uh, decided to take advantage of the opportunities it avails? Uh, I haven't, we haven't gotten much feedback yet. We haven't gotten any data uh, as a, the state government doesn't usually start studying things until six months to a year after they've been enacted, just so there is some actual data. Uh, but I have received two, maybe two calls from individuals in Montana that said, oh, thank you. I have a chronic illness and I've been wanting to take this, you know, phase one approved drug and I just can't because I'm not terminally ill. So this gives me the ability to do that now. Uh, so that was shortly after implementation. I haven't heard anything um, since. I don't know where, you know, how many people are taking advantage of the program. Um, I've had manufacturers reach out and say, you know, we're really interested in coming to Montana now because of this. Do you have any pushback from the federal government? We just want to make sure that we're good. We haven't. Mm. Uh, I don't know what the final decision on those companies have been if they've moved to Montana yet, but uh, there has been some very high interest in coming to Montana because of this law so that people can get the, the medicine that they want. Now, remind us, you may have went over this already, but phase one, do you, are you are familiar about like the specifics of that or what exactly that means in the process of getting to what are the base requirements just for, you know, to be able to have in the Montana right to track was, what was what phase one exactly? Yeah. I, I don't know if I don't know offhand. I can't remember. I mean, I test testified in committee about what it was. I think it was a certain number of 
um, successful clinical trials, but I better, I better not comment on that because like I said, I'm not an expert in, in, you know, FDA approval policy, maybe someone in, in the, in the room knows. Look at the wall, we keep talking. <laughs> yeah. So I better, I better just, uh, let you look up the specifics. And, um, can you talk a little bit about the FDA and your, your perspective on particularly around, you know, um, healthcare and providing, um, you know, providing opportunities for people to, uh, do things that will extend their health span, extend their lifespan. Like, like what's your position on the FDA about how, basically how good of a job they're doing now? You know, I hadn't really paid any attention to the FDA before this bill. Uh, so I did, you know, I did a little digging and you know, kind of wondering the process, how they approve drugs. And it seems like, you know, when they were initially, you know, founded, they were, you know, they kind of had two main goals, safety and efficacy. And now it just seems like it's safety. And, you know, that a lot of these drugs are just, they have, their goal is to make sure that their bases are covered, that they are covered from liability and that the drug is safe. There's not a lot of, you know, liable or efficacy, uh, you know, standards that there used to be. And I mean, hopefully this bill gets back to that so that there can be more trials quicker uh, so that, you know, these drugs show that they actually work and that they can get out to the, the people quicker. So I think there needs to be a reform at, at the federal level, um, massive reform from just what I've learned in the last year is that it seems like a lot, a lot of bureaucracy to try to get something approved uh, while other drugs you know, may from some big pharmaceutical companies may have an easier time because of those relationships built uh, that, you know, may not have a lot of effect, but they, they are safe. So they get, you know, they get approved and they're on the market when there's other drugs that um, are safe and very effective. They're just taking so much time to go through the process because of all the bureaucracy um, that, you know, these startup companies might ha have that relationship with the FDA that the big pharmaceutical companies have. And, uh, you know, they get, it's not, it's not, you know, free market, um, you know, let the best drug win. It's a lot of bureaucracy that's slowing stuff down. So there needs to be some major, major reform in the FDA. So, so looking it up here with these clinical trials, uh, it seems like one of the most uh, defined part of gradients between the phase one, phase two, and three, phase three, before it gets to phase four and FDA approval is just the amount of participants in the clinical trial. So to pass phase one, it says has to have been done in a small group of 20 to 80 people. And the purpose is to evaluate its safety and identify side effects. Then there's phase two, which is 100 and 300. And that's just also for safety and effectiveness. Phase three is 1,000 to 3,000. And again, it just says is for safety and effectiveness. So the real cool thing, it sounds like, with phase one is that if someone has a novel therapeutic, they can be able to just go past the, uh, uh, get. you know, you get 20 people together to try it and get some good data on it, then you're in Montana, you know, ready to ready to rock and roll. Yeah, and that makes, you know, with, with this opening up, you know, that gives these manufacturers a place to go and people who may want a treatment to know where to go. You know, before this, you don't, I mean, if I wanted to go enter into a trial for a certain issue that I have, medical issue, I, I wouldn't know where to go. But I know that Montana has this law and I know that uh, manufacturers there are there to do this. Um, so I guess, you know, as a representative of Montana, we feel it's a great thing to get people here because they'll now know where to go to both manufacturers and people who want to try these drugs. Yeah, it seems like it's only been about eight months since you've passed that bill. And you're saying you've already got manufacturers reaching out to you saying, hey, you know, this might be a spot for a new base of operations. I, I, it does seem implausible to me that because of this, Montana could become a good spot for medical tr tourism for all like the coolest, newest therapies. I, I actually grew up in Montana, so I'd be really excited to see that. I was just going to ask about medical tourism because this almost feels like the reverse. Instead of having to leave Montana to get a medical 
uh, procedure done outside the, the state or the country, it's what you're doing is you're, 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 you're drawing in people who are trying new uh, therapeutics into your, your state to make it available to your state residents. So uh, that's, that's really very interesting. Yeah, and talking to these manufacturers, they thought it was just ripe for the people that they're looking for. So the native-born Montanans are aging. We just we're a rural population. We have an older, older population. So they've got some diseases that may want to be studied. And at the same time, right now, currently, we are one of the most visited states in the union um, with you know with tourism. So there's people already coming here. Uh, let's give them another reason and it'll help you know our montana's economy on top of that so those talking to those manufacturers they just thought this was just a perfect situation for the people that um you know their clients yeah i mean i wonder if you have the numbers and your research of what it takes for these manufacturers to get to phase one versus what it takes to get to phase four because i've heard it takes like a billion dollars to launch a drug whereas you know phase one you know it sounds like it's obviously a lot less you know yeah that's that's a really good question uh that'd be a great selling point too i i, I don't know what it is uh talking to the manufacturers that were interested their biggest issue was just finding space and finding a lab where you know montana doesn't have a lot of uh, lab spaces we do have a couple of universities but you know we just don't have the large healthcare industry that some other states have so uh that was one issue that that may be you know having to overcome that it costing using eating less money to break in um would be helpful so well you know so I, let me understand this a little bit better because it sounds like the bill is for patients um i guess manufacturers there because they 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 see a market that they can uh use these these novel therapies so um for instance there's a, a woman named liz parish who wanted to lengthen her telomeres and she she had to go to columbia to get injected with telomerase uh, and she has a, bio, a biotech company could she open up a shop in in montana and offer you know telomerase injections uh and be able to serve your 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 state with that yeah, as, as long as it's past that phase one of FDA approval, um, where other states you wouldn't be able to do that. So Mon come to Montana. Um, you don't, don't no need to go all the way to South America. You can do it right here in Montana. I actually know Liz Parrish. Uh, I haven't met her in person, but we've spoken several times. She's a member of a, a minor political party I'm associated with. So it's um, cool to hear you mention her too, Dan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually interviewed her um, before she got the treatment done, and um, she she asked me to come and shoot the treatment. And at the time, I was really busy, and I've been kicking my, myself ever since because, like, that's like longevity, you know, history in the making that I I just totally slept on and missed, you know. Um, but but you know, it's just. And I've heard, I've heard, and and that's what she said is that you know she she runs a biotech company. She was offering services outside the country um, because she didn't feel uh, with the the regulatory um, atmosphere able to you know be able to to explore the 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 therapeutic she was developing in in the U.S. Um, even though she's a U.S. resident. I'm wondering on a federal level though, like uh, what you think can be done um you know to expand you know the, the that ability or freedom mm -hmm. to uh you know in in the transhumanist community we call it morphological freedom it's like it's my body i can do with it what i want you, you know like, like like what at a federal level do you think uh you would be able to help or uh once you know you get to washington well i'd like to see this expanded medical right to try expanded at the federal level uh, and, and then once that is done, you, you can start showing that through the data that, hey, this is this is successful. Um, you know, now let's shift NIH funding to making sure that we can, you know, have these preventative medicines and that it's not just the, the whack-a-mole, this disease came up, sick care system that we current ha currently have. So I think I'm, 
this is for me the first step is to get this nationwide and just like it was initially implemented with all these other states adopting this let's do the same with expanded and once it's expanded you can really start getting the data that it will affect other policy once people in the legislature or executive branch uh, start seeing that hey this is being very effective and it's interesting to me that your your entry into this is primarily to give your constituents uh, more uh, affordable health care. It's not necessarily uh, that uh, to that your your main focus is to expand health health span and lifespan. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I mean that was this my you know original goal is to just help people have lower health care and stay on their farms and ranches longer because they can keep working the land. Um, especially while we have a big issue with succession here in Montana that uh, farmers and ranchers, children, grandchildren just aren't ready to come back and take over the the farm that's been in the family for generations. So, And, and they want to keep working. People here love to work with their hands as part of our culture. And so it was just, that was my initial goal was we got to keep people on you know the generational family farm we got to keep them working and investing in their community because that's what they want to do. And to do that, we need to lower healthcare costs. Now, once I got into it, I've seen all the benefits of, you know, what, what this can be. And, you know, personally, I've like, this is, I, I've gotten really interested because, you know, I would love to live a longer, healthier life as long as possible. So, uh, yeah, well, it's been, well, it's been well, quite a journey. Yeah, tell me about the the personal journey. Uh, like, what are you what are you learning? What are you excited about? You know, uh, in terms of for yourself. Yeah. Well, I've done so. I've done a couple conferences now. Uh, attended one, spoke at one, and just learning about. I guess it's really. Um, I just really enjoyed learning at how how fast the. Um, like the longevity movement is taking off because, um, you know, we're starting to see some data and some gains. And then it really makes you want to focus on your health and what you're doing and how you can help for not just you live longer, but your family and how, you know, coming from the political perspectives, how do we do that? You know, we, we let people innovate. Uh, we give them the funding, you know, the tax credits that we can to let them develop so that it can live longer. Uh, that's and healthier. So that's, I mean, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, I it's still, I mean, I definitely still have the, the legislator representative perspective, but it's been really cool to, to learn more and more about the, the future and uh, living longer. Well, let me ask you this. So, uh, you know, Dean Kamen, it is a, an inventor, invented the Segway and um, a, a lot of other products. Um, he has uh, a company to 3D print organs at scale. At uh, it sounds like they're 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 ready to go pretty much now. If they pass, you know, that phase one, would he be able to come to your state and be be able to? People, if they chose to do organ, uh, you know, if they have a failing kidney, like, would he be able to give them a 3D printed kidney or, or you know, uh, what other, the other organs he's being able to 3D print? As long as it's, again, as long as it's phase one approved by the FDA and that you've considered all other options, uh, you know, there might be some pushback there on what is currently being used for, uh, you know, um, organ transplants, uh, but if you know if you can't find an organ, uh, then then you've considered all other options, and then you just you need permission from your provider that that works for you. Then then yes, I can oh, I can speak on that. I um I I'm actually the recipient of a transplant. I had a heart transplant about two years ago. Despite being a young guy, it was sort of a genetic and viral kind of thing, but it is very hard to find an organ. Like I spent four years with a cybernetic heart that had like a cord coming out of my tummy, like a backpack. So I was wearing on my back that I had to deal with. And the whole time I was considered what status four in transplant terminology, which means everything's fine. You're stable. Things are going good. You're taking care of yourself. You're healthy. Now contrast that to status one, which is you're, you're about, about to, to die. You need, you're unhealthy. You need an organ right now. 
someone smart might notice right away the incentives are a little unfortunate there because someone that's doing a really good job eating healthy and taking care of themselves is then the healthcare system's effectively saying, oh, you're fine. You know, you don't need that. Whereas someone that N not necessarily, you know, their own fault, but if it is their own fault and they're not taking care of themselves and get to very low health, then they would receive the organ beforehand. Like as long as they're not smoking, that's the one thing that they really test for. So the idea of people being able to, being able to expand that supply of available organs through the process of 3D printing is extremely exciting. And I really hope this Dean guy does get something going in Montana. I would, I would love to see that. Yeah, that would be great. Mont it'd be great to have Montana as the state that helps awesome. eliminate that four-year process yes. of everything you had to go through. You know, why why four years if we've got the we've got the capabilities to do it now? Yeah, of Montana to be leading in that. So I've heard you talk about the economic benefit to to your to your state, but I'm curious if you've thought about. Um, um, Maybe how it applies to the state or how it applies to the whole country. That if 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 the people who are working on life extension, health span extension, if we're able to live 150, 200 years old, you know, what do you think that the impact will that will be on the economy, on the GDP, etc.? Yeah. So this is this is interesting to me as you know a politician and having to balance budgets and looking at what the feds are doing. Uh, you know, it's. To me, it's like, okay, we're 34, $35 trillion in debt as a country. If, you know, people can work longer uh, or want to work longer, that can help buy down uh, the debt as, you know, for every year worked is helps with the national GDP. Uh, but, you know, in that case, we'll probably have to look at Social Security and how that whole system is now. It's probably just not sustainable as it is right now, but we would definitely have to look at uh, how we do that. Um, you know, I, I think, I think it's, I mean, I think it would be great for the country. Uh, you know, if it, it allows people to work longer if they want to, and not just working longer is innovating longer. And that's important. I mean, that's what America is about is innovating and competing. And that gives people longer to do that if they want. And that can just, you know, it can snowball all this research that we're getting. If people are living longer and want to continue studying this or so be, part be part of, research sure. projects that uh, expand this so i think it's just great for you know what we can build as a country i i 100 agree i feel like the longevity dividend is going to be the huge benefit here getting people to um i like to say be able to work longer i i think as you age your body starts breaking down people start feeling pain in their joints that's one of the first things um, I'm a freight broker, so I have to move very quick in my work. I'm talking on the phone all day. But even five years ago, I was still felt myself as, as, you know, a little bit sharper and more, more aggressive than I am now. Um, and I'm relatively young despite the health issues. So it's one of those things where I think people don't stop working and retire because they're like, oh, I've worked enough. You know, I'm done. I, I think people often enjoy their work and their careers and they're sort of forced to retire because of the pain of sitting in a chair eight hours a day that it puts on your stress and joints and then your body can't repair itself and then you know you start having the age-related cognitive decline and see everybody around you still sharp and quick while you're having some trouble with memory if we could get rid of both of those things i think that the, there'd be so many more people to be willing to say, heck yeah, I want to keep working. I'd love to keep working. I enjoy what I do. Yeah, and I don't know if it's different. I mean, I just grew up in Montana, so that's definitely the lifestyle is, you know, I, I enjoy working. I'm going to work till my body gives out. And then I don't just go home and sit at home. You know, I, I, I go and volunteer at the local senior center or, you know, you know how, you know, volunteering or you know, just they always pick up something else to do. Most aren't just sitting at home. And I know, I mean, that's not the case everywhere, but I just, there's a lot of people here that it's just part of the lifestyle. They just want to keep moving and being active. And as you mentioned, the longevity dividend, those potential numbers are just massive. So if people want to keep working. They should, you know, let's, let's allow them to do that. When, when I was on the ranch, you stopped working when the sun went down. 
Jack, I'm curious, do you have any uh, particular protocols or therapeutics or uh, things happening in the space that, that you're excited about? Well, um, so I've been working on my cholesterol recently. I try to focus on one thing at a time. And I just checked my results from uh, April, and I got my ApoB or my ApoLipo B, uh, ApoLipoProtein B score down to a 38. Uh, Peter Atia, I'm a fan of his uh, community. I'm a paying member. It's expensive, but he gives really good show notes. And I, I love his clarity of, and preciseness of his speech. But a really interesting article saying he thought we could get ASCVD down to negligible levels in this country. That's atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. If we could get everybody's ApoB score down to about 30, and he lays down some some data as for why. Right now, clinical reference range when you get a lipid, lipid panel is a 90. Um, so if you have below a 90, you're considered good enough. But uh, Peter Atia kind of makes the case for something called hyperbolic discounting, where he argues that you don't say, okay, I'm taking damage now, but the damage is going to happen way off in the future. That's when the issue will be, so I won't worry about it now. He makes the analogy. He says that's kind of like saying, well, you know, yeah, I'm smoking now, but I, but I don't have lung cancer quite yet, yet, you know, so there's no real reason to, to even, even slow down yet. I haven't hit the level where I need to slow down. So... I managed to get my ApoB down to a 38 with uh, some extra statins, some PCSK9, uh, and polycosinol, a Cuban drug. But um, I've been, uh, it's, it's a plant sterile, but it's used in Cuba. So I'm really interested in the lipidology space, seeing what we can do to be able to get rid of ASCVD in America. Because I think, I, I agree with Peter Atia's kind of general thesis, which is that we don't really hit Hayflix limit necessarily and have people dying around the age of 125. That's like our theoretical maximum. We have people dying when they get heart disease, when they get cancer, when they get Alzheimer's. These are the things that kill, not, you know, he finally got so old he died. It's very rare we have people living. I think the oldest living recorded was 122. We have people dying way earlier than that. And if we want to fix that, we want to fix the things that are causing um, the most damage over the longest period of time. And we want to try and fix them early. So anything that I think would reduce those levels, but be safe, that's okay for ta being taken a very long period of time. Um, maybe new newer blood pressure medications too. That's another important one to keep under control. Those, those are the things I'm excited for. But honestly, I'd say let the free market go at it. You know, if we can get 20 people to do a test and then tell people, say, hey, you know, you've got a wave liability, so there's that. But, you know, then try what you want. You're a smart, free-thinking individual. You've done your research on your own. You believe this is right. Your doctor agrees with you. you. Go ahead. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Ken, Ken, do you have any other uh, thoughts or uh, that you want to pursue? Uh, boy, you know, I maybe just have something for the audience is, you know, expanding medical right to try in Montana was something that came up talking to groups like this. So if you if there's something that you see that needs changed in the government or there's a policy you'd like to see implemented, reach out to me. I'd love to you know, work to get it well, passed in Montana. On that note, I'm curious how you feel about classifying aging as a disease. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you, you know, you, I, uh, I've learned that being in politics, uh, there's always a, you gotta be careful with definitions because it affects a lot of things, but I am for that. Uh, it would open up a lot of things, uh, in Montana for funding uh, which I think would be really important to help innovate and do the research. So, yeah, I'm for that. Um, yeah. It seems to be a big roadblock because the FDA doesn't consider aging a disease. So any therapeutics that it doesn't even really cover people trying to develop therapeutics for aging because it's, it's not classified as a disease. And um, if that could happen, I think that would open up a lot, a lot of things uh, for, you know, innovation. Yeah, I mean, there's just there's, there's so much research funding in disease. 
why let's let's classify and define um, aging as the same. It, it doesn't make sense that we're not researching it with our you know our dollars when we're just doing. We're we're really limiting ourselves as as a country in our research by by doing that. So I want to circle back to something you said earlier about bringing stuff up to, to you to pass in Montana or how you got it going at a local level. What was, so you mentioned there was a little bit of pushback from the extreme right and extreme left in terms of, oh, they're going to be crazy drugs versus, oh, there's going to be crazy drugs. Um, so I'd, I'd say if we here in our various states wanted to get something like this for our state dearly not that i don't love montana but i'm in indiana now and i would absolutely love to see it here you know maybe get a little friendly competition going between the states yes competition is good <laughs> what uh what kind of things should i do at my local level or who should i reach out to to try and say here's what my friend in montana did how can we get this done here would you sponsor a bill or what i'm, I'm totally dumb to that so give me i mean if you have some pro tips i'd love to hear them yeah there is some massive opportunities to make some radical change at the state level uh to do that i would recommend just reaching out to your local representative first your state rep or your state senator uh whether it's just a cold email or a cold call um, you know, most are good about getting back to you at the, the state level. Uh, and that's, I just start building a relationship with those people or a staff. Uh, and then it's about education. You mentioned the extreme, both extremes were a little worried about the legislation, but just didn't know, they just didn't know the issue. So it just takes a little education of, hey, this is what we're trying to do. This is what the bill does. The sky's not going to fall. Uh, you know, is this something you'd take up? Uh, we've seen it in other states that this has happened. Or, you, Mr. Representative, can, you can lead the nation in this. And that'll get the ears to perk up and say, oh, okay, I want to be a leader in something. Um, it just, it just, it just reach out to your local representatives. It goes a long ways and just start building those relationships and, and just ask them straight up, would you be willing to carry legislation that does this? Uh, if they say no, uh, you know, they might not be an expert like I wasn't, but um, ask who would be, who who can a state rep, a state senator that you could get in touch with that would be interested. Uh, in my experience, state legislators are very open to discussion from their constituents or other constituents that you might not get at the federal level. Fascinating. Okay. I think that's good. I think I've got something on my agenda for next, next week or next couple of weeks now. Good. All right. Well, I think on that, we, we'll, we'll close out our, our discussion. Uh, Ken, it was such a pleasure meeting you and uh, your your campaign. And and congratulations on moving uh, longevity forward with, with the bill that you passed. Thank you. And thank you for all your guys' support. Uh, this has been great. And uh, I appreciate all the continued support um, from the longevity uh, you know, movement. So thank you very much.